I think we can start so we can close the doors so still some people can get in. But uh, So thank you very much uh, for being here and welcome to the panel on the financial consequences of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we thought that given the importance uh, of this event and its potential economic and financial consequences, it would be good to have uh, a panel like the one uh, we have today. Uh, before uh, introducing the speakers, I would like uh, to mention that this panel uh, is sponsored by the Banking Initiative at, um, uh, at ESE. Uh, in fact, you have also an exhibitor in the hall. Uh, this is an, in an initiative that aims to foster research uh, on open questions in banking and financial markets, academic seminars, conferences, and the public debate on regulators and practitioners. And the flagship of this initiative are some yearly reports uh, we, uh, we do. Uh, the first report we did uh, was on um, uh, financial regulation post-crisis uh, in 2008 and post uh, uh, the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis. Uh, the first uh, report, as you see here, uh, was sound at last, assessing a decade of financial regulation uh, with Patrick Bolton, Steve Cecchetti, Jeff Giardantin and myself. The second was on the bank business model in the post-COVID uh, world, uh, banking in a low uh, interest rate environment and uh, with the presence of digital technology and digital competitors with Elena Carletti, which in fact is on my right, Stein Klassens, uh, Antonio Fatas, and, and also myself, where I participate in the reports. The third one was on the resiliency of the financial system to natural disasters. This pointed out not only to climate change and its uh, consequences uh, in finance, but also to other um, natural disasters, like, for example, um, a pandemic. Uh, so this uh, was, uh, we had again Patrick Bolton, uh, Marcin Karsovic, um, Harrison Hong, and, and myself. And then finally, the last report that we presented in June was on technology and finance. Uh, with Daryl Duffy, Thierry Foucault, uh, Laura Belkam, and myself. And this was on the impact, basically, of new digital technologies in, um, uh, in the digital currencies, uh, central bank digital currencies and other digital currencies, uh, on um, the value of data, which, in fact, is the, uh, the keynote speaker uh, tomorrow. Laura Belkam will speak uh, about that, um, uh, about uh, the value of data in, uh, in finance and, uh, and economics. And also, uh, it dealt with um, electronic trading and how it's transforming uh, market, uh, and, uh, market quality parameters. And the next one, so this is in the making, it's in fact related to uh, what the, the present panel uh, will be talking about. Not the same topic, but related, which is the, the, the title is the International Financial Order After the War. Um, possibly hinting that there will be, there may be some changes, and this, uh, the author will be Giancarlo Corsetti, uh, Barry Eichen Green, uh, Jerome Zettelmeyer, and, and myself. Okay, so without further uh, ado, um, I would like uh, uh, to uh, introduce the panel and the topic, in fact, the topic of the panel and, and, and the panel itself. Um, I guess it doesn't need a lot of introduction, the panel, because uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been a shock no, to the world economy and to Europe in particular. Uh, we may think that Russia is not so important economically because it has a, a GDP which is like between Spain and Italy. So how can this make a big difference? Uh, the only um, issue is that uh, Russia is systemic in terms of energy and agricultural production, apart from the minor detail of having nuclear weapons. Okay, so um, and looking forward, it will continue to be crucial in energies. For, for example, just think about the potential future importance of shale energy production in Siberia. Okay, so this is uh, one of the reservoirs uh, which are uh, there. Uh, what's the consequence? Well, uh, prices no, in energy have uh, and agricultural products, we have seen them going uh, through the roof. This has increased inflation, threatened recession in several Western economies, Europe in particular, we'll talk about that, winter is coming. Uh, furthermore, the war in Ukraine and the uh, associated sanctions to Russian partners uh, may provide, and this is related also to what we're going to talk today, 
an impulse for a decoupling no, of economic and financial systems, the West and China, perhaps, dividing into blocks. I don't know. This is up to uh, discussion. In any case, what I think is clear is that geopolitics comes at the forefront, and we are interested in the economic and financial consequences uh, that follow. Finance is being weaponized, but uh, sanctions to Russia do not seem to have dented, at least apparently, seriously its economy. And this is something open to debate, I think, uh, here, you know, uh, the Russian Central Bank has imposed capital controls, sharply increased interest rates, this has uh, stabilized the ruble, uh, higher oil prices, and more or less the same uh, sales uh, have uh, given tremendous revenues uh, to the Russian Federation. Okay. So the panel, I think, will talk about all these topics, will examine the consequences of the war no, for financial uh, systems in Europe and the world at large. So let me uh, just introduce uh, now, um, our panelists, they are excellent uh, panelists, all experts in different areas, but I think uh, which can illuminate this uh, important topic. Uh, I start with Elena. Uh, Elena, um, as you know, is professor of uh, finance at Bocconi, uh, is member of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board and a member also of the Board of Directors of Unicredit. Uh, she is the current president of the European Finance Association. I was program chair last year online. but. Uh, second, um, we have uh, Harold James, is uh, professor of European Studies at Princeton University and professor of History and International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School, also at Princeton. He's a um, well-known economic historian with many influential books on Germany, the international monetary cooperation, the euro and globalization. So very well placed to talk about the topic today. Further on, uh, Lucrezia is a professor of economics at the London Business School, a trustee of the Center for European Policy Research, the CEPR, and of the International Financial Reporting Standards. So that's a foundation, that, that, that's a long. And uh, she's an applied macroeconomist and econometrician and was director general of research at the European Central Bank. Uh, finally, uh, Nicolas uh, co-founded Bruegel, which is uh, in Brussels, which is one of our, uh, I mean, maybe the most uh, important or influential European think tank. Uh, then joined also the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, which is another extremely influential uh, think tank internationally and in the US. And now shares his time in both institutions. He has held senior positions in the French government and in the private sector, and his research is primarily about financial systems and policies with a main focus on Europe. Um, so the contributions uh, to the panel, we have organized them in the following way. Uh, each speaker will have uh, 10 minutes for an initial um, uh, statement and contribution. Then we'll debate a little bit in the panel and then we'll open the floor to uh, Q&A questions. Questions uh, you, you, which you can put in writing uh, on the little piece of paper and that you, they will be forwarded to me or also uh, in, uh, directly if you want. Okay, but we will keep both uh, methods. Um, so I have proposed that Harold uh, starts with a little bit of historical perspective, then Nicolas on the implications for the global financial order, including the impact of sanctions, Lucrezia uh, in particular on the repercussions in Europe, if I'm not mistaken, and Elena on the repercussions on banking and global uh, banking. So uh, thank you very much. And so please, uh, Harold, the floor uh, is yours. Well, well, thank you, uh, Xavier. Uh, it's uh, an enormous honor to be here with you and uh, to discuss with this, this wonderful panel. Uh, Xavier asked me to start with a historical perspective, and it seemed to me to be appropriate to think of what kind of conflict this is, uh, what exactly happened on the 24th of February, and where did it come from? It's an invasion. It's a war, but for a long time before the 24th of February 2022, President Putin and others were talking about how war had changed in the 21st century and how war had become a hybrid war. And hybrid war is one of the phrases I think that's in everybody's mouth and everybody's mind. Uh, hybrid war is military, but it's also about information or disinformation, uh, about intelligence, but it's also about finance and economics. And 
the background to this story and thinking about why Russia changed its stance. Uh, President Putin, after all, came into power just at the turn of the millennium. And at first, at the beginning, there was a widespread thought among Western leaders, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair or uh, President George W. Bush, uh, thought of him as somebody you could really trust and do business with. Um, President Bush said he looked into his eyes and uh, thought that he could trust him. And the turn, I think, uh, in Putin's policy uh, came around 2007, 2008. Uh, it's conventionally dated with a speech to the Munich Security Conference in 2007. Uh, but I think it will also obviously hit everybody in this room that 2007, 2008 is the moment of the global financial crisis. And that this is a critical turning point in the way in which Russia related to the rest of the world. And in particular, after 2007, 2008, there was a very, very influential narrative that was pushed by many people in the Russian government and in Russia uh, that the end of the old order had come with the global financial crisis, and in particular, the old order focused around the United States dollar. And so what would happen would be a new financial order uh, with, without the dollar or with a replacement for the dollar. Um, recently, over the last days, uh, the rather strange ideologue who may or may not have influenced Putin uh, Alexander Dugin has been in the news because of the strange attack uh, on the, the killing of his daughter, uh, Daria Dugina. Um, Alexander Dugin wrote repeatedly about the way in which the new Eurasian order was going to be focused around something new in monetary terms, and he went back deep into financial history and talked about gold as the foundation of every kind of stable currency. And he thought that gold was particularly appropriate for Russia. Uh, gold was in the Russian icons. Gold was linked to orthodoxy, to religion in, in Russia. Uh, gold was the way of the future. Um, but there was a search for something uh, other than uh, the US dollar. Um, and since then, since 2007, 2008, uh, there's been a turn in a progressively radicalized uh, direction. I wanted also to think about the context of what happened after the 24th of February, because it seems to me that there, there are also some historical lessons. It's obviously too early to really dissect what exactly went on in the minds of President Putin and his very few advisors who seem to have known about the plan before it was launched on the 24th of February. But the initial reaction uh, seems to have been uh, that this was intended to be a very, very short conflict, that it was intended to decapitate the Ukrainian government and install a new regime because the regime that had been there since 2014, 2015, um, was thought by Russia to be consistently illegitimate. And uh, Russia was talking about restoring an old regime in place of uh, the, the Zelensky um, government. But then, obviously, the war wasn't a short war. And uh, as it changed from being a short war to being something else, there needs to be a rethinking. And uh, I think it's, it's striking that that has been going on on both sides of the, the conflict, on both sides of the lines. Um, and the critical story, I think, has a very deep historical resonance in that it looks like an echo of what went on in 1914. In 1914, 
the beginning of the conflict that people see as the, 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 the seismic event that shaped the whole of the uh, 20th century. Uh, in 1914, the thought was also that this would be a short war and nobody thought that it would be uh, going on longer than Christmas, and uh, there were lots of uh, analyses, um, including by uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, that the European countries simply couldn't fight a war that went on uh, for much longer. Um, so the war was going to be short. So when it isn't short, and when the war becomes a stalemate, as it is now, um, then the attention turns to another way of fighting the war. It can't be solved in a widely held view, both in 1914 and in 2022. It can't be solved simply by military means. It has to be solved by all kinds of other political, but also economic and financial means. And so the vision um, in Russia is increasingly that the economic strain of the war will tear the European Union apart and will separate the European Union from the United States. And the enemy is not just Ukraine, uh, but it's the EU and it's the Western Alliance. Um, and the story there, I think, is a simple and quite plausible one, and it's plausible to many people in Russia because they're very familiar with this story, uh, that inflation is a powerful solvent of federal systems. Inflation creates all kinds of suspicions. Everybody thinks that they're being taken advantage of. In a federal system, it works in a centripetal way. And people remember the great inflations of the end of the Soviet Union and of the last days of Yugoslavia as dissolving those entities because there was the thought that inflation, if you were in Yugoslavia, inflation was run by a central bank in Belgrade and the people who had access to that central bank had all the benefits of it or run by a central bank in Moscow. So you needed to get away from that. And th that, I think, is the logic that is being applied to thinking about how Europe would break up with increasing discontent about the role of the ECB and worries about different inflation rates and different strategies. The rates of inflation vary very much from one European country to another, from one Eurozone country uh, to another, the highest rate at the moment in over 20% in Estonia. Um, so the thought of, of a breakup induced by inflation. Um, and then on the other side, I think there is also a gamble uh, that this war can't be sustained for very long by Russia because of the application of sanctions and because of the uh, growing isolation. And so the idea is that uh, the sanctions will undermine the legitimacy of the Russian regime and uh, prompt a movement to replace uh, President Putin. Um, so sometimes this is expressed directly, um, notoriously at the end of his speech in, War in Warsaw, uh, President Biden uh, said, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Um, and then the administration rapidly backpedaled and denied that regime change uh, was part of the program. Uh, but it's difficult, I think, for anybody to imagine how you can do a peace deal sitting down uh, with President Putin. And so if you want to have a peace, it needs to be, as in the First World War, incidentally, with some other government. And in the First World War, both sides repeatedly tried to undermine the other side, that uh, the British pushed the Arab uprising against the Ottoman Empire, the Germans pushed the Irish rebellion in 1916, the Easter Rising, uh, the Germans transferred Vladimir Lenin and his companions in the sealed carriage from Zurich to Finland and then to the Finland station in Petrograd and to start the Russian Revolution. So ending the war by overthrowing the other side politically and in the 
circumstances of the First World War, or also with inflation, um, is, is, is quite part of the uh, strategy. And so what I think you're looking at at the moment is which side is going to give in first. And the question is, if the war goes on into the autumn and if the situation with the gas supply in Europe becomes more acute and if there's widespread unrest about gas prices or energy prices or rising prices in general, uh, won't the governments get weakened and won't they collapse? Uh, we, we have uh, some Italian nationals on the panel, so uh, you know, I think what you're looking at next is the election in Italy, uh, but there will be other elections, the midterm elections in the United States, and the thought is that if Putin can hang on until then, uh, that the united front will disintegrate. And the thought uh, on the other side is that uh, uh, the uh, degree of incompetence which the Russian regime has manifested in fighting this war, and maybe the financial strain. The financial strain, it, it's, it's um, what is it? It's, it's supposed to cost Russia um, about half a billion dollars a day. So if you make the calculation, uh, on the back of the envelope, that's about 6% of GDP. It's not nearly as devastating as it is for the Ukrainian economy, but it's still pushing higher inflation in Russia as well. And uh, there's a brain drain. Uh, many young Russians are leaving. Um, it's difficult to see any future of Russia at all uh, because the other countries are looking quickly to replace Russia as a source of energy. So the long term uh, looks very, very bleak uh, for, for Russia, and it is quite plausible uh, to think that there may be a collapse of the Russian regime. So the lesson from history, if you want a brief lesson from history, is that both sides are really gambling with the collapse of the other side, and the collapse of the other side is not just Ukraine. Um, Ukraine looks extremely resilient, uh, but it's Europe and it's the European relationship with the United States. Um, it's a tragedy that after a hundred years, over a hundred years, the worst events of the early 20th century are being replayed. And thank you. Thank you very much. Nicola. Well, um, that was masterful and it's impossible for me to even try to match uh, Harold, so I will try something, uh, I, will, I will do something different. I will not talk about Europe, even so I obsess a lot about Europe and uh, I'm pretty sanguine about the Italian election uh, impact, not the result itself, but the impact. But I'm sure we'll discuss that. Not to, going to talk about Russia. Um, to complement what Harl just said, uh, I recommend the article in The Economist this week, which is uh, one of the best I've read recently on this kind of balanced judgment on uh, is the Russian economy going okay or not okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Ukraine, uh, even so I think there's also a big issue of the prospect for hyperinflation in Ukraine and what consequences that would have on Ukrainian resilience, to use the word that Harald has used. But I'm going to talk about the global financial system. Uh, the global financial crisis, or the great financial crisis, as it probably more accurately should be called, um, 15 years ago, unle unlike what Mr. Putin uh, and many others believed at the time uh, in, uh, in Harold's narrative uh, didn't change the face of the international uh, financial system. It didn't uh, introduce a new financial order. If you look at the financial system in the last 10 years, it actually looks remarkably like the one we had before the great financial crisis. And even formal mechanisms of international cooperation have been incredibly resilient. For example, we had a major uh, uh, agreement in the Basel Committee, finalization of Basel III in late 2017 under Donald Trump, of all people. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you look at the global financial integration, it has continued uh, by and large to progress, not regress, uh, after the great financial crisis and until now. So I think this is useful to keep in mind uh, to understand that in the end, in the midst of a crisis that is only starting, and I echo Harald here, that uh, you know, the consequences of the um, invasion of Ukraine are only starting to unfold, uh, it's very difficult to predict the structural consequences. So, uh, and of course, there has been a lot of talk about China, the RMB displacing the dollar, uh, 
uh, digital currency, RMB, et cetera, but at this point it's all token, basically no uh, facts on the ground. So what have we learned? Um, I think we have learned something about the sanctions themselves. The I, I will talk only about the financial sanctions, so not talking about export controls or what's being done in the energy space. Very important, but I think less central for this audience. Uh, so the financial sanctions. I'm also not going to talk a lot about the oligarchs, you know, the uh, boats that are being seized and uh, in some cases confiscated. Uh, but, um, but the financial sanctions, so uh, sanctions on banks and particularly sanctions on the central bank. So if you think of the freezing of the Russian central bank reserves, this was actually unprecedented. This word is kind of cheap, but, uh, but it does apply. Uh, this is the first time ever since the international financial system has been built up the way it is, if you think, for example, of the creation of the Bank for International Settlements in the uh, early 1930s. Uh, this is the first time that a, a core member of the BIS, which is part of all the inner committees, or almost all the inner committees, including the uh, Committee on the Global Financial Systems, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Basel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, etc., is subject to sanctions, not just by major other members of the BIS, but by the BIS itself, which announced that it froze the Russian Central Bank reserves a few days after the invasion, basically at the same time as the EU and everybody else. So these sanctions were pretty big. The Russian finance minister uh, has said $300 billion frozen uh, in uh, central bank reserves, and at this point I think it's the most reliable source even, so I wouldn't take everything that Mr. Silvanov says at face value. Um, pretty um, quick, in a matter of days after the invasion, literally the next weekend, uh, and uh, incredibly widely shared and coordinated. So when you think that not only the US, but the entire EU unanimously, Japan, Korea, Singapore, but also Switzerland, Mo Monaco, uh, San Marino, uh, you name it, uh, all reserve currency issuing um, jurisdictions, con convertible reserve currency issuing jurisdictions, because China, of course, didn't participate, and you can say the RMB is a reserve currency, but to a very limited extent. But all convertible reserve currency issuing jurisdictions participated in the sanctions in the days after the invasion, and the BIS was then. So this is, this is very remarkable, and I think it tells us something about what can happen and what cannot happen. Because frankly, you would have asked somebody like me in January, can this happen? And I would have said, probably not. And I'm considered uh, maybe a globalist. Uh, so. Um, so that, that is a new data point. It's something we learned. If we think of the financial sanctions on the, on the banks, the, the situation is much more murky uh, because it's a more complicated space. It's not just kind of you do it or you don't, but also because uh, the EU is the main player here. And yes, the, and for two reasons. First, because that's where the big money flows are uh, between Russia and uh, other jurisdictions but also because uh, the EU is the home country jurisdiction of SWIFT and therefore is the one that can uh, de-SWIFT uh, banks, uh, uh, basically uh, cut them off from the SWIFT system, which is important, even so it's not as important as some people have made it uh, sound, like you know, all this talk about nuclear, et cetera. Uh, it's not nuclear, but it's important. So the EU acted relatively quickly on some banks, but not on most Russian banks. With some delays, they have sanctioned Sberbank, which, as you know, is by far the largest Russian bank. And I think they will continue. So you see a kind of bank, banking decoupling uh, of Russia from the EU driven by sanctions, which is happening much more slowly than the, uh, what happened in the central bank space, but which is happening and, uh, and has consequences. So importantly, the reason why it's happening more slowly is not because of a problem of international coordination. It's just because of the policy trade-offs from the EU standpoint and basically the um, concern by EU policymakers and uh, in the Council uh, not to harm their own economy uh, by sanctions that would be too swift uh, on the Russian banking system. So we may come back to this in the Q&A. 
there are many issues here. Okay, so that's what we have learned so far, uh, which I think is relatively little, but still significant. Now, what will be the structural impact of the war um, on the global financial system? Well, it's too early to tell. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly for the kind of reasons that uh, Harold uh, hinted at. And I think you could argue that there are actually two polar opposite views that you could plausibly defend on the impact on the global financial system. And one view is that it's stabilizing and the other is that it's highly disruptive. I'll start with the one which may sound most uh, counterintuitive, which is this is stabilizing. It actually, it's not counterintuitive at all. So the view is that Russia committed an egregious violation of international norms, which I think I don't have to expand too much on, and therefore, sanctioning Russia very hardly, but only Russia and in a coordinated way by all the other jurisdictions that matter, is an extraordinary statement of uh, togetherness of the global financial system, and basically the system works. So it sets the right incentives, it creates the right discipline. And therefore, nobody will want to do what Russia has done. And in a way, you can see that to a certain extent, uh, but only to a certain extent, in the behavior of China, which has not uh, violated any of the financial sanctions or other sanctions for that matter, uh, because clearly they don't want to uh, be the target of similar things uh, unless it comes to a vital interest, of course. So this is stabilizing. The global financial system will get out of it even stronger, even more cohesive, less fragmented, uh, more integrated, and more uh, able to do international cooperation. So opposite view, of course, is this is disruptive. Uh, elements of, financial, of the financial architecture that used to be non-political, like the good work between central banks in Basel, are being politicized. Uh, you now, using the dollar is not a safe haven because it's subject to uh, politically driven sanctions, and the system will never be the same because this has been unveiled as the truth of the system. So the whole point that you know, the BIS was non-political, central banks were able to talk with each other, all that has been revealed as a, a falsehood. And uh, now the system is fragmented because everything is political. And in a way, this is not just Russia's view, but it's the view of many observers in the West and, and, and of the serious internationally oriented uh, liberal observers in jurisdictions uh, outside of the West and Russia, so in the global South, starting with China. So for example, if you take Yu Yongding, who is, as many of you know, one of the most uh, respected, serious, uh, 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 talented and, uh, and, and authoritative Chinese economists, uh, he very much expressed that view in the Project Syndicate piece in April. So which of those views? I mean, those views cannot both be true. One of them will be revealed as the right one or something in between, but we don't know. And of course, it will be past dependent. Um, uh, and, and I'll uh, finish there. Uh, so take, for example, the debate on Russian uh, central bank reserves. Uh, as you probably saw, and I hope we'll have time to come back to that in the Q&A, there are people who say, let's confiscate them. And it's very tempting. We have, let's assume we have 300 billion uh, frozen. Again, the exact amount is not clear, but let's assume that's uh, the order of magnitude. Well, that would finance almost half of what the Ukrainian government claims is, would, will be the cost of reconstruction. Of course, the war is not over, so who knows the cost of reconstruction, but Ukrainian government says, I think, 700 something billion dollars. So uh, if you use, you confiscate the Russian reserves, you finance half of it uh, almost, it's good. Uh, but of course here there's a trade-off because confiscating the reserves is an incredibly more aggressive move than just freezing them for obvious reasons. And, uh, and, and many people, including myself, for what it's worth, think this would be a very unwise thing to decide to do now, even so maybe it may become uh, the right thing to do in the future. But that's not the only questions that's open. There is also, also, of course, the financing of Ukraine itself, because at this point, Ukraine doesn't have a sustainable fiscal and uh, macro trajectory uh, in front of itself, and monetary trajectory, to, for that matter. But also, what will be the choices of China, of course? It has been kind of sitting on the fence. It's probably not sustainable until the end of the, this uh, sequence. And uh, uh, naming the unnameable uh, of the US 
also because there's an election if, in 24, and who knows where that will go. So um, my time is up. I want to just conclude by going back to what Harl said. Um, this is looking like it will be a long sequence. It's not going to be over by Christmas. Many things will happen, and um, most of these things uh, are things we cannot predict now. So uh, it's too early to answer Xavier's question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will answer them again later. Um, um, Lucrezia. Yes, thank you, Xavier. So uh, if I interpreted well, I was asked to talk more about the macro aspect, focusing on the EU. So let me make uh, three points, which may be obvious, but have important implications. The first, the first one is uh, that the war in Ukraine has unleashed a crisis which is very different from the ones that we have recently experienced, the financial crisis of 2008, the Eurozone debt crisis, and then COVID. And at the center of this crisis is energy and uh, geopolitical real, real, realignment, uh, which sees the EU uh, in a particular weak position for basically two reasons. The first reason is that uh, the EU is an energy importer, not uh, an energy producer like the US. So in that sense, we are in a very different position. Oh, and not only, the question is not only energy, but also the dependence on a variety of commodities which are important uh, for our you know, project programs on, on renewables and the green, related to the, to the Green Deal. The second uh, weakness uh, is uh, that we are not a federal state with a common fiscal capacity. We don't have a common army. We don't have a convincing common policy. Now, the lack of common fiscal capacity is an old story. It has been abundantly you know, analyzed in the context of the last few crises. Uh, uh, you know, we have seen how we have reacted with COVID, uh, and that was uh, you know, uh, understood by, by many to be a progress with respect to the way in which we handled the Eurozone crisis. Uh, so now we are again confronted uh, with the problem that we will have to face a huge fiscal effort uh, in uh, a situation that, from the fiscal point of view, is very fragmented. So this is an area of risk. But, uh, you know, this time is not just about fiscal. It's also about, uh, you know, basically the lack of common army, the lack of common foreign policy, and also the lack uh, of a common energy policies, which probably will be a problem uh, in uh, designing those policies that uh, we need to design to deal with the long-term issues that uh, this crisis uh, um, are you know, in unveiling. So that's my first point. The second point uh, uh, is that uh, this crisis is mo mainly about energy and, um, and the geopolitical, and it is a geopolitical crisis. Uh, and uh, this uh, climate and energy interact very important uh, with the climate crisis. Uh, and again, uh, here we have uh, the EU is, not, uh, uh, is, is fundamentally unprepared. In other words, uh, you know, the, uh, the energy crisis related to the war challenges uh, uh, an important policy and an important com uh, common commitment of the EU, which is the Green Deal, uh, beside uh, you know, challenging uh, the EU energy independence. So, so these two things are related. That's my second point. So the, the, um, you know, the ability to continue the commitment on the Green Deal and uh, uh, our ability to achieve energy independence uh, is actually, are actually related. And uh, if we don't you know, put these two things together, Actually, a very uh, important element uh, of uh, you know the viability of Europe and the competitive of Europe uh, and so on will be will be challenged. And the third point I want to make uh, uh, is that, of course, the, the war has economic consequences in the short and the long term. This uh, uh, is all over the paper. So far, the discussion has very much focused on the short term, but actually the, long ter the, the issue is the long term because uh, related to the second point I made, uh, the uh, energy and uh, the link with uh, the policy for climate transitions uh, are really uh, have to do with uh, the European competitiveness uh, for the long term. So let me just say a few things about the short term and the, and the macro environment. Uh, 
um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it is obvious that uh, uh, the energy shock has produced a very significant slowdown. So the, all the, mm, the, the forecast for 2022 and 2023 has been revised downward. And uh, if you have looked at the, at the recent numbers uh, of service indication uh, just released a few days ago, this uh, actually points to increasing pessimism. But of course, there is still very much uncertainty about uh, what will happen uh, to, to, to what kind of slowdown we are going to have. Is it going to, is, is going to be you know, a mild recession or is it going to be a longer recession? That, in my view, will depend on what will be the dynamic of the war and uh, you know, the ability of the European industries to adapt to an energy crisis. The longer the war, you know, the harder it will be. It is not only to forecast what's going to happen, but of course the, 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 the pessimistic scenarios uh, that the various institutions uh, have uh, released are becoming more and more likely. Uh, the same is actually for inflation. The question is, is inflation now temporary or, uh, or, permanent, or, or permanent? And this uh, actually, whether this is going to be permanent or, or temporary, has implications for the way in which monetary and fiscal policy has responded. So two short uh, observations on monetary policy. Uh, I will give you my view and in two words, and then maybe there will be another opportunity to discuss it in, in the Q&As. Um, the discussion has been whether the ECB has been behind the curve in fighting inflation. Well, my view is actually that uh, the ECB has been rightly cautious because at this point, uh, what Europe is facing uh, is an inflation which is mostly supply driven. In that sense, uh, we are in a very different situation from the US. Um, you still you have to consider that gas prices are today 10 times higher than in the last decade. So this is like a very, very large shock. So for the ECB to target uh, a fast uh, uh, objective of going back to the 2% or you know, inflation target, that would mean that other prices, and prices other than energies, will have to decrease by something like 20%, if not more. So this is a huge cost in a situation in which uh, you know, there is quite a lot of uncertainty of whether the, you know, the, the, you know, there will be rationing uh, next time and whether you know, this will be a lasting conditions or not. So um, I think that uh, in this sense, the ECB has been in the right place and uh, actually has also showed uh, uh, you know, the ability to innovate in its policy instruments, uh, for example, in uh, uh, designing this anti-fragmentation instrument uh, to deal uh, with uh, fragmentation in the sovereign market. Now, on fiscal policies, I'm less optimistic. Actually, fiscal policy um, and, and you know, all the policy aim at limiting uh, the effect of energy prices. Uh, uh, we see that uh, a lot of uh, uncoordinated action at the national level we have in some cases seen a nationalization of electricity company, company, for example, France and partly Germany. Uh, electricity price caps, tax breaks, uh, you know, policies that go in all kinds uh, um, of directions. And, uh, and this is actually is not good, uh, first of all, because uh, you see an, uh, policies uh, which uh, are not necessarily coherent uh, with uh, our Green Deal uh, objectives. And, uh, and you see uncoordination uh, for uh, um, you know, uncoordinated actions which may jeopardize the ability of Europe uh, to actually to face the crisis. Basically, there are th three problems with this approach. Uh, one is uh, the, um, the known uh, uh, coherence with the climate objective. For example, uh, you know, the, uh, there have been uh, in, uh, most economies, including the IMF, uh, have expressed themselves uh, against price caps, but in favor of subsidizing the losers. Uh, we see that at the national level, countries have gone in quite different directions. Uh, we have seen a difficulty on developing a common EU energy policies. Um, and uh, you know, there is a risk uh, going, uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, if the war will continue, uh, we will see actually energy nationalism rather than coordination in energy policies. 
and actually a reluctance uh, to share the risk with the countries uh, which are more hit by, by energy prices, for example, Eastern Europe. And so this goes in the direction of the risk of fragmentation that Harold uh, was, uh, uh, was, um, was discussing. And uh, the third point is actually national fiscal policy will wait on national budget. So far, the, 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 the weight of, uh, of the various policies that have been implemented is about 1.5% of GDP. This is a very conservative estimate because it does not consider you know, new measures uh, which uh, uh, are uh, you know, being announced uh, you know, every day. And, uh, you know, in that respect, uh, uh, you know, it is very hard to see how Europe can deal with uh, restricting monetary policies and expansive monetary pol uh, fiscal policies uh, without, some la without some kind of common fiscal capacity and some s instruments uh, to, you know, with, to achieve that coordination between monetary and fiscal policies uh, that uh, we have, for example, uh, um, of, you know, achieved during the COVID crisis. Now, the last observation is that actually that uh, uh, the, the big issues be besides this uh, kind of quite pessimistic observations I have to do with, uh, I have just made on the long term, on the short term, uh, um, is that the, the real issue and the real existential crisis that the EU is facing uh, is uh, that the uh, is that uh, during the decades of, of low energy prices, uh, uh, Europe has kind of forgotten that uh, energy is an important, uh, is an important question. And uh, you know, the w Ukraine war was a wake up call. So uh, in this context, uh, you know, this shock, uh, the, what is related to the war has to be understood as a negative productivity shock, which will hurt competitiveness in the long run. And, uh, you know, uh, and will, and so the, 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 the ability of Europe uh, to uh, deal with uh, energy securities and at the same time not to renegotiate the commitment uh, of the Green Deal will be very important to understand, uh, uh, you know, where we are going. Uh, now, uh, to conclude, uh, you know, is, there is a lot of uncertainty. I will conclude like uh, uh, Nicola, so, but uh, uh, the uncertainty is really related uh, on the development of the geopolitical situation and the war. And perhaps the significance uh, uh, for the EU of what is happening uh, is the sovereign realization that the common en energy policy is, indispens is an indispensable complement to the common green agenda. This, of course, implies a clear view on the position of the EU in the new geopolitical contest, uh, and uh, you know, the issue of the relationship with China, for example, which is a key supplier in the renewable supply chain, as well as key markets for the EU industry in this new ge geopolitical contest, uh, will be the next topic. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, wait and see where you know, this, uh, you know, the dynamic of this conflict uh, and uh, the negotiation of a future peace uh, will lead us. But in all this, we have a very weak EU voice. Thank you very much. Uh, Elena, what about banks? Yes. <laughs> so first of all, um, hi to everyone. And thanks, Javier, for asking me to take part of this panel. I knew I would speak as a last. And I also knew that the audience is quite wide in terms of interest and knowledge of the banking sector. And maybe this was the more technical part, in a way. So what I thought of doing is just to draw my remarks on my experience as Unic in Unicredit so, and to tell you how a bank has been looking at the consequences of the crisis in a very practical terms. So to start with, let me just say that the banking sector entered uh, in the crisis very strongly. So you will hear from policymakers again and again that European banks enter with the common equity tier one on average above 15 percent at the beginning of the war. Just as a matter of reference, at the beginning of the global financial crisis, this ratio was almost half of what is this now. So this means that in, 10, in 20 years now, uh, sorry, no, in 15 years, we have constructed a much stronger banking sector that has doubled almost the level of capital that it had 10 years ago. And also in terms of liquidity, that it was in 2007 the main problem, or one of the main problems of the crisis, we have now liquidity regulation where the main um, indicator is the li liquidity coverage ratio. This ratio should be above 100 percent, 
Just for information, European banks entered the crisis with a liquidity coverage ratio, which is more than 170%. So on the solvency side and on the liquidity side, banks are strong. They're, they enter the situation in a very strong way, despite COVID. And also in terms of the famous non-performing loans, that was the other side that was a, a problem in the last 10 years, on average, European banks have 2% of NPL ratio now. Of course, with big variation, you still have countries like Spain, Italy, where banks have a higher ratio. But again, overall, on average, the banking sector is way cleaner than it was at the beginning of the, of, um, of the global financial crisis and certainly in the last 15 years. Now, the war comes. How do banks approach that? So first of all, is the end of the low interest rate environment? which for banks, as you may know, is actually not very, was not very positive. In particular for banks that were basing their activities on commercial banking, meaning taking deposit and lending, this was a disaster because they couldn't anymore make profits on net interest income. So for the first time after decades, now banks start again making profits on the net, in, on the net interest income. So this is the positive news, if you want, of not just the war, but simply of the increased inflation and therefore of the increasing rates. Of course, this comes with challenges because higher rates means, means also higher cost of borrowing for banks. And in particular, also for what Lucrezia was saying, because of this fragmentation that we have in Europe, what we are experiencing again now, and this is going to be the core also referring to the Italian election, but not only, of sovereign spreads in the next medium to sh short to medium run. Of course, the more we will have a, a spread uh, dispersion in Europe, the more the banking sector, in particular, depending on the location of the banks, of course, in the different countries, this will have an impact on the borrowing cost of banks. And the other challenge of higher rates is, of course, cost to income ratios. So banks need to invest. They need to invest in particular in digital and the IT sector. These are sectors that already before inflation and before the war, there was a big competition for talent in attracting people because they are highly on demand. The more inflation, the more the wage spillers may be coming, the more banks will have to choose between increasing their cost or uh, cutting down on the investment. So this comes for what concerns rates and the big movements of rates that we have seen. Then we have, of course, credit risk. So how to think about the war in terms of credit risk? Well, there are two main ways. First are direct exposures. We do have uh, some banks that have, one of them is Unicredit, unfortunately, that has subsidiaries in Russia. We have three European banks, or we had three European banks, one of them exited. These were Societa Generale in France, Raiffeisen in Austria, and Unicredit in Italy. They had subsidiaries in Russia, so they were exposed locally to the Russian economy. Societa Generale just exited, the other two are still present. But then we also have banks, not many, and again, Russia is not a big economy, as Javier was saying, so we have some cross-border exposure of banks. What does that mean? For example, a, a German bank lending, I mean, giving the loans to Gazprom, and in dollars, typically, so this goes into the dollar problem that uh, Nicola was experiencing. So these are the cross-lending, the cross-border exposure that some banks have with uh, Russia, and these exposures amount to about 25 billion overall in Europe, so it's not a big exposure. But again, they are concentrated in the hands of a few banks. And the concentration, as we know, if it is an important concentration, an important um, amount of exposure, it's worse than dispersion because, of course, it may raise the risk of uh, um, individual failures, although we are very far from it, very far. But exposures to Russia may occur, as I said, either at the local level through local subsidiaries, or through cross-border exposure with this lending to the Russian corporate. Now, let me say up front, this is not an issue per se, in the sense that if we abstract from sanctions, these companies, these Russian companies, are all very credit worthy. So, Norris Nickel, Gazprom, all these companies, they wouldn't have any problem in repaying this exposure. This is a matter of the sanctions, that of course, because these exposures are in dollars, then these companies may be forced or constrained or whatever not to repay. So for the bank perspective, it's not that they've given bad loans or whatever, it's just a dysfunction. is generating this system of technical defaults in technical jargon that is making life a little bit more complicated. 
Then, of course, there are the spillovers effect. So what it means in terms of increased energy prices, uh, what it means in terms of potential recession. So from the credit risk, direct exposure, local and cross-border, and spillover and secondary round effect. Then we have another effect, which is the market risk. So we had an increased market volatility in recent months. Of course, banks, in particular those that are more active on, in trading, they may have more impact from this exposure. We have seen, in particular, large commodity price swings. We have seen some margin calls uh, um, uh, in, uh, in March. But so far, let me say, the situation is manageable. So, so far, these high swings in commodity prices are reduced a little bit, and the situation is, uh, um, is manageable. Then we have operational risk, something I think that in academia we don't really speak about very much. But here there is a matter of cyber risk. Of course, the Russian war, the war has increased cyber attacks massively. It has required banks to invest massively in setting up infrastructure that was able to deal with the increase in cyber risk. So far, again, there have not been major attacks. So, so far, the situation is again manageable, but cyber risk was already before, and with the war, even more, it has become one of the, prom the most prominent risks in the banking sector. And finally, we have sanctions, that is also part of, if you want, operational risk. Now, Nicola said before there was an unprecedented cooperation and uh, unanimity among the Western countries, in particular, in imposing sanctions, yes. But if you go and go more, it will be more operational. This cooperation did not translate in identical sanctions. What it means is that the different jurisdictions, Europe, the US, the UK, Japan, did not use the same language when the sanctions were uh, written. They didn't sanction the same entities in the same way. So from the bank perspective, it's understanding the language of the sanctions is very complicated. Before, banks were used to have only sanctions coming from the US. And they were very well experienced in dealing with OFAC, with the Department of Justice, and so on, because this was a very well established way of sanctions. But now we are in a situation with multiple jurisdictions, multiple languages, as I said, multiple entities. And therefore, from the bank perspective, simply you know, understanding what they are supposed to do is very complicated. So what are the consequences of this? is that we may be seeing fines to banks in the future if they are unable to deal with the situation. We have seen the block payments in recent months, so payments that were blocked maybe erroneously because the correspondent bank was unable to understand whether the client was a sanctioned client or not, and according to which jurisdiction. So, which, I mean, are you asking banks to follow all jurisdictions, or should banks just choose to follow the jurisdiction that they know are going to be stricter in the implementation of sanctions, so nobody is going to violate U.S. sanction. You can be sure of it. But Canadian sanctions, has Can Canada ever applied a fine, or w what is going to be the behavior of the Canadian authority in imposing fines potentially for sanction breaches? So sanction is something that is, in is creating a lot of um, operational difficulties to banks, just for the reason that they don't know what, what and to which extent to follow them and how to interpret, interpret them. Now, if I look very briefly, because we are already, I think, running out of time for your question part, the second part, but if we are looking very quickly at where do banks stand after six months of war? So what I've done, I've just gone and looked at the second quarter results of the major European banks, just to give you an idea of what the banking system is. So first of all, the first quarter was very positive, and everybody was saying, OK, now let's wait for the second quarter. It will be start already giving sign of deterioration. But actually, we haven't seen a sign of deterioration yet, and I will show you a table in a second. So broadly speaking, all European banks have done very well in the second quarter. They are actually now promising or wanting to promise big dividend distribution, which of course raised the question how prudent should they be looking forward. And of course also on the basis of what they said before, it's very difficult because you don't know where and I mean how the conflict will evolve. So results have been broadly positive. There's been a significant increase in revenues, in particular driven by the net interest income, as I was saying before, and costs have been contained so far. The direct exposure, as I said, there were three banks, 
e società generale eh, Unicredit e Raiffeisen, società generale sold the subsidiary. The other two are actually don't have a problem on the local subsidiary because Russia economy is still working um, despite the whole situation and because they are international banks, they actually tend to attract clients rather than, uh, uh, than the contrary. The cross-border exposure I was mentioning before, therefore the loans to Gazprom, to Nickel, to Norris Nickel, to all the Russian corporations, they have been reduced substantially. And how banks have reduced this exposure? They have uh, swapped assets. So a European bank had a loan with Norris Nickel. They have given this loan maybe to a Russian counterpart that was not sanctioned. And in exchange, they have received another exposure maybe on an Estonian borrower or on another borrower in another country. So in this way, they have managed to reduce exposure to Russian borrowers, just swapping assets. So overall, also the cross-border exposure of the banks have been reducing significantly. So now what really remains the issue from a credit perspective is this, this second round, the spillover effect, the potential recessions and so on, and the energy driven. But so far, we have not seen big sign of deterioration of default of borrowers. This I already said, so let me just show you for the sake of being on the same page, this table. Here you can see the European Global Financial Institution, apart from BBVA, which is not the GCF, but I have introduced it for Jean. So if you just look at the first, the first column, this is, did the results in the second quarter beat expectation on the NIS expectation? You can see apart from, some, from a few banks, in particular Credit Suisse and UBS, but for different reasons, and, BB, uh, and um, Santander, all the others have beaten consensus. So it means their results have been better than expectations. And you see in the other column, you can see how the net interest income, their costs, and the common equity tier one is now relative to one year ago. And you see that there are few reds, meaning that very few banks have worsened the position relative to one year ago. So actually, in terms of capital, in terms of cost, and, and so on, they are actually doing pretty well so far. They're not doing uh, badly or uh, as badly as one could have expected. So going forward, again, very difficult to predict whether we are going to have what, what we are going to have. Of course, the big issue is how they are going to prepare themselves for potential reduction in growth. This is really the main uh, the main question. And um, and I think uh, and, and I want to say one more thing that no, none of the other mentioned. I think the war brings big implication in terms of ESG. So there has been a big emphasis on finance, moving to transition, going to green, ESG, and so on. But now Europe is in a situation of having to become independent from the Russian energy, which means restoring coal, in many, at least in the shorter run, or it means developing renewable energy. So what's happening right now is that the financial system, and in particular banks, are asked to finance, again, assets that until two months ago, they wouldn't have wanted to finance. So either they go against their policies and they start financing coal again, or so on, or it's not clear who is going to finance the transition. So I think there is a big implication here in terms of climate and ESG, at least for the next six months, one year, two years, until maybe Europe become de facto more independent from the Russian gas. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think all this has been very interesting. And uh, before uh, opening uh, uh, the, the floor uh, to general questions, which uh, I repeat, you can also write uh, if you don't want to ask directly. Um, I, I, I would like just to put one question for each of the panelists uh, that very quickly they may try to, um, uh, to answer because we don't have um, a lot of time. And I will start with Harold. Okay, and since you have uh, studied, I think, uh, quite a bit globalization, right? And there is a lot of talk, uh, and in particular in, in finance and in financial markets, whether it has stopped or is just slowing down, um, or this talk about potential decoupling and financial decoupling in uh, both currencies and, uh, and, and, uh, and in finance. What's your view on that? So given, I mean, looking at the past and trying to think of what may happen. So what's your view on that? Where are we? Well, well, and what's the impact of the war, obviously? Um, 
Th th thanks. I, I, I think that's a, that's a absolutely great question. Uh, it's really, in a way, the central question: What's it going to look like? What What's the world going to look like? And uh, I have a thought there that's also based on a kind of thinking about historical patterns. Uh, that is that there are various shocks that hit the globalization process. And the deglobalization <coughs> episodes that we've experienced in the Great Depression above all, but also after 2008, when it really wasn't a deglobalization, but a slowing down, a slobalization, some people call it, were demand shocks. Whereas when supply shocks hit, and the war is in a sense an extension of a supply shock that already hit during COVID, and it, it, it's the COVID supply shock that made it more attractive, I think, for Russia to use energy as a way of manipulating global politics. With supply shocks, the lesson is actually both from the, the, the two big episodes of supply shocks in the past, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the 1840s, a terrible period of food shortages and political chaos. And then the 1970s, uh, some people in the room, uh, I, I do at least, uh, remember the 1970s. And at first, we thought that the 1970s was going to be one of these moments of deglobalization. But actually, the extent of the supply shock raised the question of how you are dependent on inputs from all over the world, how there's a global dependency. And uh, the 1970s made for more rather than less globalization. So in the end, I'm actually rather optimistic about the way in which globalization will take place. But you know, it's important also to note both the 1840s and the 1970s pushed globalization in a very new direction. So the globalization that we're likely to see is likely to be more in terms of services, IT, and less in terms of the globalization of goods. Okay, but, uh, thank uh, you very much. An optimistic scenario. I'm glad that uh, we have some optimistic uh, views uh, here in, in, in the panel. So, uh, Nicola, um, uh, on the sanctions, have sanctions ever worked? Uh, have they worked in the past in, in, in different episodes in financial? No? Or, and so how to build then an effective financial strategy in a sense to contain Russia? So what do you think of that? Yeah, I'll, I'll be nuanced uh, as you would expect. I mean, uh, it depends of course what you mean by working, but uh, uh, I think there is one example which is in a way specific, but uh, where sanctions have on the face of it being very effective, and that was the 2012 episode with Iran. Uh, and like the sanctions on Russia, they were very internationally coordinated, so they were not just unilateral US sanctions, uh, and uh, they arguably had a, a role in the shift of Iranian policies that led to the joint comprehensive uh, plan of action. So that then didn't work, or may, uh, maybe was just suspended, who knows, But but I think that episode of Iran, Iran 2012 was a success story for a coordinated sanction strategy. So um, now there are a number of examples where sanctions didn't hold their promise, or at least didn't solve the problems that they were supposed to help solve. But I think it would be naive to think that financial sanctions or even sanctions more generally can, on their own, tilt the balance decisively in something as all-encompassing and complicated as a war. So, uh, so, so I mean, in the current war, we haven't, told, uh, we haven't talked at all about the military situation um, because that's not where we have a comparative advantage. But you know, sanctions are not directly military. Uh, I think at this point, the military uh, question dominates. As Harald reminded us, it, there's, a, there's a very strong likelihood that Putin thought he would win the war militarily very quickly. And he hasn't. And actually, when you look at military experts in the West, and at least on the face of it, even the US government, the US intelligence community was right to say Putin would attack, but they were wrong to expect that he would win quickly. Because the baseline scenario from the US intelligence community, at least based on public information, is that uh, Putin would uh, seize Kiev and all the big cities and then would face 
intractable partisan resistance and uh, insurgencies that he wouldn't be able to manage. But the baseline scenario was not at all what has actually happened. Uh, so, so I think we have to be very humble here. Um, Harald is right that if you look at the World War I, increasingly non-military factors uh, played a role that, and it was not military alone, but that doesn't mean that military was non-important. Uh, and uh, so, so the military side remains all important, I think, in any war situation. And I think we have to be very humble about our ability to understand it collectively, given this initial failure of essentially everybody to understand the basics of the military uh, landscape uh, and uh, balance of forces here. And, um, and I think sanctions can only be one part of the toolkit. And so, so I, I think when you say, can sanctions work, I would say, can they contribute to reaching the objectives you have? And on this, my answer will be yes, if they're internationally coordinated and well designed, uh, but they're not going to be the only um, knife in the kitchen. Very well. Um, so let's continue with um, Lucrezia. And in fact, I also received a, a question that I think it's the something I, I, I was thinking of, uh, of asking you uh, broadly. It's on the energy transition, which is very central, no? Uh, so, and, and the wake-up call, so how this wake-up call will help Europe uh, uh, to fulfill the energy transition. Has it to be modified? Do we have to reformulate it? Is it reasonable to stay the course as it was, or we have to do, or we have to do some thinking and some uh, some reformulation of this? And, and as, as as an aside, um, do central banks have a role in here or not? So this is still quite debated. Okay, so my view is that of anything, we should uh, commit even more strongly to the net zero objectives. Uh, I think that energy, energy security is linked to the ability of Europe uh, to keep this commitment. But it is also true that in the short run, uh, we, we have a problem. Okay, so the question of the policy that we have to design is to design policies that will secure, you know, that will make us more independent from Russia in the short run without compromising on those objectives. And here is where chaos comes because each country has gone in different directions. For example, putting price caps, in my view, is not the right objective because if you put price caps on energies, uh, then, uh, you know, that means that uh, you do not uh, try to decrease demand. And uh, the right thing to do now is try to disincentivize demand for fossil fuels uh, as much as possible. To achieve this complex objective, uh, there is uh, then a question of des designing of national policy, possibly and you know, ideally in coordination with some tools uh, which uh, have to be at the federal level because uh, they will be much more uh, efficient in terms of uh, negotiations uh, of uh, contracts, in terms of uh, uh, organization of sanctions, in terms of uh, resharing uh, within the EU, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for that, uh, we need to step up common energy policies uh, with tools that we do not have at present, not legally and not uh, you know, in our policy toolbox. Now, central banks, what do they have to do with that? In my view, very little. And central banks uh, uh, have to be green uh, uh, as investors, you know, like private banks have to be green in investors in terms of their purchases uh, of uh, private assets. Uh, you know, it, uh, it is more than reasonable that central banks will follow the standards that regulators are asking private uh, banks uh, to follow. And uh, central bank, of course, have to be aware that climate, what are the implications of climate risk for price stabilities? Because climate risk, as we have abundantly witnessed this summer, for example, implies uh, 
that uh, uh, you know, they, we are facing uh, high volatility of prices uh, uh, because, as I tried to say before, you know, the energy issues with, uh, with climate uh, you know, interact. And therefore, uh, you know, strategies for price stability have to, be, to adapt to this kind of changes in relative prices, which are going to be more frequent and more sizable. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elena, to end uh, this round and, and to move forward, um, you, you've talked about the consequence for banking kind of short term and long term. Um, so what impact do you think uh, this event will have moving forward, in particular for global bank operations? No? And, and not only I'm thinking not only Europe, but Asia. No? Um, so if we move towards a more bipolar world, no? And, and if you think of really global banks, so there are not so many, yeah, uh, when, uh, when growth is in Asia, uh, in Asia and then you know, on the face of the China-US conflict, or will global banking is dead, in a sense? Or truly, or so, and banks will retreat into their regions and, and etc. Okay. So how, how do you perceive that? I think a banking will follow the geopolitical equilibrium. So if the geopolitical equilibrium will be an equilibrium of becoming good again, and therefore the positive scenario that Nicola was expressing before, in terms of strengthening, which I think strengthening in terms of globalization and geopolitical worldwide, I think is going to be difficult, at least in the medium term. But certainly banking will be following the geopolitical equilibrium. So the equilibrium will be more segmented, more fragmented, more denationalization, I mean, re-impatriation also of productions, uh, so of, you know, everything has to do with the economy. Banks will also follow, so you, I don't think you can have a global banking in a world where there is no more globalization, international flows to the same extent there were before. So what it will be driving, I don't, I don't think it will be finance, I think it will be politics and the geopolitical equilibrium and finance will follow. Okay. okay. So that's an interesting idea. So uh, before continuing with the uh, um, uh, with uh, s some of the uh, written questions, I, I think we we have in the first row uh, Tanya Babina, who is uh, involved in a, in a group, and he wants to uh, tell us something. And in fact, I would like to ask her also uh, her view on the on the effectiveness on the sanctions to Russia. Yes. You, you'll get, you, you'll get uh, uh, microphone. a microphone. And they, you I'm also going to need it, right? Uh, so first of all, I'm Ukrainian. I'm from Donetsk, uh, area. And um, most of my work is related to the Russian Federation. Uh, and I'm very proud of appreciate it. So if you are not aware, go to econ4ua.org uh, and find out about how to donate, how to pitch in, in areas where you and I have a comparative advantage. Now, um, first, I want to uh, highlight a few things that I think are very important that have been missing in this panel. By the way, panel is amazing. Xavier, thank you so much for uh, doing this. We all appreciate uh, the light that you bring to the human tragedy that's Russia inv invasion of Ukraine. Yes, we're in finance, but let's not forget about the human cost of this war. Um, you know, so many Ukrainians are suffering. My hometown is reduced to rubble. People have no running water, etc. It's bad, right? Now, also Ukrainian economy is down in GDP to 50%. And it's very important to support Ukraine to be able to continue fighting for their independence and for their freedom, and for their lives. Now, another thing that I want to mention, if you maybe don't care about Ukrainians so much, uh, is we are, in economics are trained about thinking about counterfactuals, right? And to understand the implications of this Russian war is going to depend how the war is going to end, right? Imagine 
the most horrible scenario, it pains me to say this, but imagine West does not do enough, Russia wins, what's gonna happen next? Let's think about economic implications of that. We're gonna have huge increase in military spending. We're going to have um, encouragement of local dictators to invade other countries. So you're gonna have huge increase in conflicts around the world, right? If we cannot defend the democracy, we're gonna have more of these autocratic regimes invading neighboring countries, right? And it's going to be a mess for a long time if we don't help Ukraine win. So let's think about that counterfactual. Now, sanctions, right? Xavier asked me to talk about sanctions and um, I've been leading effort as part of our group in understanding and designing the sanctions as well as understanding their impact as part of international um, working groups on sanctions, which was led by former Ambassador McFall. Um, sanctions, do they work? I don't know yet. We're actually actively leading work on trying to measure carefully impact of different sanctions, trade sanctions, financial sanctions, uh, IT sanctions, trade sanctions. If any of you are interested in helping and pitching out, please talk to me. We need all the hands and and bright minds that, that are willing to, to help. Now, I think, you know, some of the things that you mentioned, I think uh, uh, Nicholas mentioned this, is that sanctions are absolutely necessary, but they're complementary to military help to Ukraine. But in my personal opinion, and given that uh, we put out a lot of proposals on sanctions, uh, that many of them have not been implemented, we just didn't do enough and quickly enough. So my personal sense from trying to dig into this is that they, so far, we didn't have a big dent into Russian economic capacity to finance the brutal war. But we can do more. And the faster we can end Russia's economic ability to finance the killing of Ukrainians, and if Russia wins, they're gonna go on to other countries. There's a reason Baltic countries, Poland, everybody's scared because we've seen this pattern. Think about economic uh, trends and economic patterns. Russia has been doing this for decades. So we need to do more. Um, what's gonna happen in terms of economic consequences and financial consequences of this war will depend on how and when this ends. And I think democratic countries can stand together and do the right thing. Let's not be repeat Second World War when Hitler invaded Poland, everybody stood on, on the side. I think that's very appropriate analogy because if Russia wins the war, it's not gonna end there, okay? That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zavia. Tanya, thank you very much. Um, so um, we, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, not much time, but I'll try to convey um, uh, them to you. Um, one question which I, I was tempted to ask myself, um, there's someone in the audience or someone who lives in the US, uh, is a little bit surprised that the issue of China and Taiwan has not come up. I did it, as I mentioned it. You mentioned it, okay, but, but, but not in the elaborate. Out of time. <laughs> yeah, so. not elaborate, right? Um, so I don't know. Could, uh, uh, could you uh, uh, say something uh, about uh, maybe the lessons uh, for the potential conflict on China and, 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 and Taiwan? So, what, what, I mean, have we learned something uh, uh, about this issue, which is, I think, uh, as. Um, as I think many people may, uh, may think, the Ukraine thing may be a little thing compared to a China, Taiwan, US, etc. conflict. Okay, so I don't know. I just want to say some, I'm not gonna uh, say anything about, uh, you know, what the implication for Taiwan, because, you know, I think either Nicolas or Harold should, should say that. But, uh, I mean, if we think about Europe uh, and uh, the Green Deal and the energy security, we cannot do it without China. So 
therefore, you know, whatever the world is going to look like, you know, in the next future, if uh, we are only, if the idea is that we are only going to trade uh, and do business with our friends, i.e. the US, Canada, Australia, and so on, this is not going to work. That's my point. Yeah, I, I, well I agree taken. very much Harold. with that. Yeah. Um, no, I agree very much with that. I think the, the, the um, you know, proposal that Janet Yellen fl floated about friend shoring is a very, very dangerous one. And, uh, you know, we need to think of everybody as potential cooperators in dealing with these global challenges. Um, but I, I, I think, uh, you, you know, the, the question of China is one that really relates very much to the moving statement uh, that we just had. If President Putin succeeds in destroying Ukraine, uh, then that will be a green light uh, for China to go ahead with Taiwan. Um, but uh, and th that's, you know, one of many, many reasons, and you, you eloquently r spoke about that, uh, why it's important to, to resist that. But I think at the moment, um, it's, it's really relatively easy to think uh, that uh, China looks at what's happening in, in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine was also an important ally of China. It, it provided the first, um, uh, the, the first aircraft carriers to uh, to China in the 1990s. It, um, uh, it's, it's part of the uh, linkage of the Belt and Road Initiative to Europe. Um, and uh, China's been very, very hesitant about this. And you know, the, the more that China sees the, 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 the failure of this operation in, uh, of, of Putin, the, the failure of Putin's attack, uh, the more I think uh, it's unlikely uh, that they would go for a military occupation of Taiwan that would replicate uh, Putin's attack on Ukraine. Nicola. Yeah, I'm going to agree, but add something. Um, so I, I, I don't think there is anything that the two previous panelists have said that I disagree with, and I live in the US. Uh, largely, uh, the US has a, a dangerous obsession with China. I don't think at this point the US elites collectively think rationally about China for a number of reasons. There is also, let's be honest, a lot of racism involved. Uh, so um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to to take a hawkish uh, position um, of the like you would hear in most uh, Washington uh, events. Having said that, and I'm not sure if it's a difference between Lucrezia and me or, or not, but I think the, the, the constructive attitude towards China can reach its limits depending on the behavior of China. Uh, and China is a, is a big, globally significant country. Uh, I think the behavior of the Chinese government, and here I'm not talking primarily about Taiwan, the same way as, as I think Tanya reminded, uh, reminded us, uh, the, the, what is at stake in Ukraine is not just about Ukraine. Of course, it, it's a lot about Ukraine, and we should, as she reminded us, think about the suffer, suffering Ukrainians and the brave Ukrainians who fight. But if we take a step back and think cynically about it, uh, the, or realistically, the, the reason particularly the European Union, went so strongly on the pro-Ukraine camp, is I think that there is a lot of collective realization of what Tanya told us, which is that if we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, he will move on to us. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think this is why the EU um, reacted so swiftly, not because Ukraine is a democracy, not because uh, uh, invading Ukraine is bad, but just because at the end of the day, we are at stake, not just Ukraine. We, Europe in the European Union. Um, similarly with China. I think if China behaves in a way that directly threatens our way of being and our political systems, and I'm not saying they're doing it now, but I don't think there is a logical impossibility of that kind of scenario, well, then we will have to trade that off with the Green Deal and other things. So, so the, the imperative of working constructively with China, which I share, is not entirely unconditional. Okay, uh, good point. So I think we, we are getting uh, to, the, um, uh, to the end of the panel, um, but th there are two questions uh, still that if you bear for me a, a couple of minutes uh, that, that I think th they are interesting. Uh, 
and they, they can um, uh, maybe um, the panelists can say something very quickly. So the first one, which maybe uh, Nicholas, but also um, uh, Elena can say something is, uh, can the Russian government circumvent the sanctions with cryptocurrencies? So this is, uh, I think it's a popular question, but uh, so. No, you said. Uh, well, my, my answer. Very quickly, I mean. My, my answer will be very quick. Uh, crypto is not big enough. So to an extent, yes, but it won't make a huge difference. Okay, Elena? Yeah, we probably tend to agree to this. We are, it's not developed enough that it can, uh, it can circumvent. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> um, um, and then but, but, but if I may, okay. um, I mean, currently, there are, I mean, what, what has been the most direct effect of the sanctions so far? It has been the technical default of the Russian government. That is, I mean, unless, I mean, if we're just strictly speaking about what happened to the faults and so on, this is the most important effect, at least, that the sanctions have imposed, that Russian debt in dollars has not been paid back. And then the next question would be, irrespective of crypto, how big is this effect for Russia? And, you know, with the debt to GDP that Russia has and with the revenues that Russia is having from gas, at the moment, the impact on the Russian economy of this technical default, in my view, is very limited. Absolutely. Final question for Haro. Uh, okay. It, it's a very precise question, but <laughs> you'll see. How would the Russian collapse look like? <laughs> Russian? Collapse. A collapse. Well, the, 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 there are two versions of it. Uh, one is that uh, th there's been a lot of criticism uh, in the Russian social media and even on Russian television from hardliners who believe that Putin has not been aggressive enough in Ukraine. And so one version is that it's a putsch from the right. The other version is that there would be a democratization of Russia. Why do you think that, uh, uh, that, that Navalny uh, chose to return to Russia when he knew that he was going to be put in prison. He thinks that he's Nelson Mandela, and I think that there is a reasonable chance of that kind of scenario happening. Uh, that's also, incidentally, why it's very, very important not to say that you use the Russian reserves absolutely to reconstruct Ukraine, uh, because if you think of what that would do to a future Russia under somebody else's leadership, under, say, Navalny's leadership, it would be absolutely devastating, and you would repeat exactly, I'm sorry to go back to the First World War, but that's exactly the post-First World War scenario. Uh, so um, I think both of them are combinable, um, that you might get a push to the right, first of all, and a breakdown of that followed by a democratization, but it may be very, very messy. Okay, so here you have the answer. Uh, so thank you very much. I think th this has been a very, very interesting panel. Uh, at least for me, I learned a lot. So thank you very much for being here and for contributing uh, to this session of the European uh, Finance uh, Association. So thank you very much. Uh, and so we have the break uh, outside. Thank mm -hmm. you.